for joining today's NeedyMed special topic webinar, Liver Wellness, presented by the American Liver Foundation. My name is Carla. I'm the Director of User Engagement at NeedyMeds, and before we kick off, kick off the presentation, I'm going to offer a few points so you can make the most out of today's webinar. First of all, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to type them into that question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just know we will reserve answering questions until the end. If we don't have the time to answer your question, we will follow up with you by email, but of course we will provide the contact information for both NeedyMeds and the American Liver Foundation at the end. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Needy Meds YouTube channel. And you can also find copies of our PowerPoint presentations and other handouts we thought you'd be interested in in, those, in that handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. So let's get started really quickly. For those of you not familiar with Needy Meds, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are. What you're looking at on the screen is our mission statement. But simply put, Needy Meds is a national nonprofit that connects people to programs that will help them afford their healthcare expenses. And we do that free and anonymously through our website, needymeds.org, and our helpline, 1-800-503-6897. Our counselors are available weekdays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Keep that in mind. We're in Massachusetts, so that's 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. I always like to put up a screenshot of our website homepage because that's really the face of our organization, and it does give me an opportunity to point out just a few things, such as if you are looking for healthcare savings, you guessed it, you'll click on that healthcare savings tab. I did mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available for our YouTube channel and you can find a link to that on the top right. Oh, and I guess I jumped ahead to the next thing I wanted to share, which is on the bottom right where that box is circled around that calendar of events. That's where you can find, read about, and register for upcoming webinars. And there's that box around the top right side icon of our YouTube channel, which I do hope you subscribe to because that way you will be notified when all new webinars, videos, and presentations are uploaded. So we're going to quickly move on to the reason everybody is here, which is to talk about liver wellness. Now, before I tell you a little bit about my friend and colleague, Warren, who's going to walk us through today's presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about Needy Med's partner, the American Liver Foundation. Their mission is to facilitate, advocate, and promote education, support, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. So now I'll tell you a little bit about our guest. Warren Hall. He is the American Liver Foundation National Manager of Support Services, and he came to the a ALF with a background in education and counseling, which both come in very handy in his work on the helpline and with the foundation's ongoing support services. And I think I have the most recent statistics. It might even be larger than this now. But what I'm going to tell you is that last year, the National Helpline assisted over 10,000 inquiries regarding liver health, liver disease, and related issues. And today, Warren is going to cover how the liver functions, the causes and risk factors and treatments for the most prevalent liver diseases. So without further ado, and hopefully seamlessly, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic and screen to my friend and colleague, Warren. And as he grabs that so we can transition to seeing his PowerPoint slide deck, I will remind everybody that if you do have questions, you can go ahead and submit them by typing them into that question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. As I said, we do usually reserve answering questions until the end, um, and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Warren. Enjoy the presentation, everyone, and thanks for being here. 
Thank you very much, Carl. Now, can you hear me? I can hear you, and I can see the screen, and I am proud of both of us for doing this seamlessly, although I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it, because there's <laughs> always room for technical, technical errors, but so far, so far, we're doing really well. Thanks, Lauren. I, I loved your introduction, especially about me. I was just going to ask you if you could just keep talking, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Listen, I'm, as I'm, everybody can probably tell, I'm not a person usually at a loss for words, so the last <laughs> thing you want to do is pass the mic back to me. <laughs> Enjoy, everybody. Thank you, Carla. And it's it's always a pleasure uh, for me to to join uh, our, our partnership with Needy Meds is not only so important, but it's uh, it's a, a wonderful relationship. As you can tell, we we enjoy each other, uh, but more importantly, uh, the work that we do is so connected. Uh, you know, many of the calls that we receive on our national helpline are folks that are dealing with some financial issues in regard to their health care. And it's so wonderful to be able to direct uh, people to uh, needy meds and to the, the many resources that they have. So it's, uh, it's, it's really wonderful. And then uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to make this presentation, which is a very basic presentation, uh, basically about the liver. And, you know, like so many people, and I'm probably going to fit into this myself, you know, 20 years ago, um, if you would have asked me about the liver, the, the probably the most I would have said was that, well, I know I have one and I know I got to take care of it. Um, however, as as fate and as so many things, interests uh, bring us together uh, in my work at the American Liver Foundation, uh, we have found that uh, educating people about the liver is so important because most people will come to us when something's wrong. And so, um, and I guess that's true really of, of any health issues, right? If we're generally healthy, we're not thinking about, you know, I, I guess my heart's okay. And, you know, my, my breathing seems to be okay. And that's cool. We don't think too much about the, you know, oh, is my liver working, right? Because it's one of those things that, well, we, we know it's there, um, but we don't really pay too much attention. However, when something goes wrong, then all of a sudden, we need to, to pay attention to it. And that's why education about the liver uh, is so important because the hope is that by understanding how your liver works, what it does, and what are some of the things that can affect it, um, we can be preventative. We can be ahead of the curve in making sure that our, our lifestyle, uh, that uh, medications we're taking, that so many other things are, are, are moving us toward liver health so that we never have to deal with any particular liver issues. And so uh, I'm so happy to be able to uh, be presenting this particular um, webinar because understanding about the liver, what it does, and also like myself, I think you're going to find it fascinating uh, uh, what the liver does and, and how it works. So uh, so uh, we'll move on here and let me, okay. So uh, about the liver, we always start here because it's so important to understand uh, what the liver does before we'll get into things about what can affect it. Probably if we were to ask anybody to say, what does your liver do? I, I think almost everybody would, would know that it's a filter, right? It filters, uh, as you see there, it filters everything we eat, everything we drink. Now, here come some things we may not have been aware of, but it also filters everything we breathe and even that which uh, gets absorbed through our skin. If you think about it, um, every when we breathe something, it comes into our lungs, but what happens in our lungs is that our lungs uh, grab that air, which, it, which it's supposed to do, and process it in a very uh, complicated way, we won't go into here, but then it, it brings the oxygen into our bloodstream. Um, but along with the oxygen, it brings everything else that we breathe in. Uh, we probably know about secondhand smoke, right? Because even a person who's not doing the smoking themselves, when they breathe it in, our lungs pull that in and then deposit whatever uh, is, is there into our bloodstream. And as all of our blood goes through the liver, so too do the things that we breathe. Um, and so uh, we have to be careful. People who work in environments, perhaps, where there are chemicals uh, or things like that, or where there is smoke, uh, 
the, you know, uh, I'm in uh, New York City, you know, when we have the tunnels here and, you know, they used to have the police officers in the tunnels, literally in the tunnels, but they realized that that was not good for their health because of breathing in all that smoke and everything. And and so, uh, so now, no longer do they do that. But um, it's so important for us to realize that the environment, the things we're breathing in, we always uh, think about that in relation to our lungs, right? But, but we also have to be aware of it uh, because of our liver. And then the other one that's probably not as well known uh, is the fact that whatever we absorb through our skin also makes its way into our bloodstream uh, and, and therefore through our liver. If you think about it, when you have moisturizer or sunscreen, when we rub it on our skin, we want it to be absorbed into our skin, right? That's the whole purpose of doing it. Uh, however, what we don't often realize is that by rubbing it into our skin, yes, it's being absorbed, but it's also going into our blood screen, bloodstream. So that's why we should be very careful uh, about the products we use as moisturizers, as cosmetics, uh, sunscreens, all that kind of stuff. We wanna make sure that there's nothing in those products that are going to be harmful uh, to us uh, as all of that gets processed uh, through our liver. Uh, and then, so moving along, so our liver also, um, you know, we say that there's over 500 functions that the liver performs, uh, too numerous uh, to, uh, to get into, uh, but things such as helping to build our muscles by the, uh, by the production of some of the blood cells. Um, the, something else perhaps that is known is that our liver helps to produce bile. Now, bile is the sometimes referred to as an as an acid or digestive juices, right? That's what gets um, uh, put into our digestive system when we eat in order to break down food into the various nutrients and things like that. Uh, if you have an, uh, uh, hopefully you do have an annual physical and you have blood tests, uh, when you look at the blood test, you're going to see bilirubin, right? That sounds like probably like a person's name. Uh, you're going to see bilirubin. Well, bilirubin is bile, um, and that's what the, the liver is producing. Um, and then the, through the gallbladder, the gallbladder stores that bile until we eat, and then the gallbladder is responsible for releasing it through our various uh, bile ducts uh, into our digestive system. Um, now, the liver, uh, of course, works in as part of a system, as almost every aspect of our body does. Our liver happens to be part of our digestive system. And so that's why um, the liver is involved in digestion. It's also why the liver interacts with other organs, such as the gallbladder, the pancreas, uh, the kidneys, right, uh, our stomachs. So all of these things are connected. And that's why somebody who may have uh, trouble in one area, because it's a system, because everything works together, we have to be careful that it doesn't cause uh, issues in other areas. You know, very often people, let's say, who have diabetes, right? They may also, because that's a, perhaps an issue with the pancreas. But then we also want to watch out that they don't develop liver disease, because all of these things are interactive. They're all connected to each other. Um, which is great when we're healthy and everything's working well. Um, but like anything else, uh, when there's a breakdown in one area, could cause a breakdown in the other. And we need to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, stops uh, cuts from bleeding. Again, that's because of the, the white blood cells that are produced. Kills germs, uh, again, because of the various um, autoimmune uh, uh, functions that the liver uh, takes part in. And so it kills whatever comes into uh, our body, and then detoxifies. This is, again, part of the filtering aspect of the liver, uh, that when we eat foods that have, let's say, a lot of chemicals, preservatives, hormones, right, all those things that, unfortunately, we do to our foods here to either make them tastier or to, to fatten up the chickens, um, you know, we're, we're taking all of that into our bodies as well. And our, our liver, because it acts as a filter, um, is able to pull those uh, toxins um, out of the, the food and everything we eat and helps our bodies to eliminate it, uh, again, through the kidneys and through our intestines. Uh, so the liver is really important. And so as you look at this screen, you have to realize that if there's a problem with the liver, look at all the things that can be affected by that. Um, and so, so this is why we want to make sure that we take good care of our liver. And we'll talk a little bit about how exactly uh, we can do that. Now, uh, as I mentioned, you know, a number of years ago, 
uh, if you would have asked me that I would be so involved in hepatology, HEPA, anything HEPA is liver. So if you would have asked me, I probably would have said that you were crazy. <laughs> but um, what I have found fascinating, probably the two most fascinating issues, uh, or I should say aspects of the liver, um, are the two that you see on your screen right now. First of all, the liver does not have nerve endings. And the reason for this um, is because throughout our lives, and we're going to see number two there, the liver can heal and regenerate itself, something no other organ is able to do. But what happens is, you know, throughout our lives, um, you know, we're kind of beating up uh, on our liver, right? Because, oh, we may not eat the right things, as I mentioned, foods that have a lot of chemicals, preservatives. We might be taking a lot of medication, right? Uh, either over the counter, which we always have to be careful of, just because we can go to the pharmacist and buy it, doesn't mean we should always be taking it, um, as well as prescription medications. You always see on the commercials that talk about um, uh, any of the new medications uh, that you hear about, you'll always hear them say, your doctor will check for liver disease. That's because, remember what we said before, whatever we take into our bodies, gets filtered through our liver. And that's true of medications, both over-the-counter um, and um, prescription. Um, so, so we really beat up our liver throughout our lives. The good thing is that, as number two says, the liver has the ability to heal and regenerate itself. And so that's why we don't see um, although we, we do see liver disease in younger people, it's, it's, a, um, it, it's not that often. And that's because our liver is always seeking health, right? It's always trying to remain healthy. And even though we beat it up, the liver is healing itself, the cells are regenerating, um, and that's keeping us healthy. All of this is happening without us knowing it. And that's because the liver does not have nerve endings. And so like another organ in our body or another part of our body, when something's wrong, right, pain is the um, indicator to us. Um, pain always means that something's not right. I'm not going to say something's wrong, um, but pain is an indication that perhaps something's not right and we should um, look into it. So the problem with the, with the liver is that over time, um, for various reasons we'll get into, um, if the liver begins to lose its ability to heal and to regenerate itself, that's when disease begins to form. The problem is the liver doesn't let us know because of the fact there's no nerve endings that will tell us um, that we need to, to take a look at our liver. We're not feeling pain. There's not going to be discomfort until much later on. We'll get into that. Um, but in those early stages, the liver is not telling us that something is wrong. And, and that's why uh, when people find out that they have liver disease, very often uh, um, by accident, uh, we may be looking at somebody might get a scan of their stomach or, or of their intestines. And all of a sudden, the doctor will say, well, you know, it, it looks like you have some fatty liver. It looks like there's something with your liver. Um, and that's because people didn't know it, because the, the liver did not let them know uh, that something was going on. And so these two fascinating, what I find fascinating aspects of the, the liver um, are, are also things that we need to, to pay attention to because of the fact that uh, although the liver seeks healing, when damage happens, we may not know it. And so, so it's going to be very important for us. This is why at the American Liver Foundation, much of our public service announcements are about having a liver screening. Now, screening means that you go look for disease, right? It means that you're not taken for granted um, that you, you have disease or you don't have it. Um, a screening means you go and you look for it. That's why we, um, you know, testing, let's say for, uh, for a virus. Oh, speaking of virus, right? We have COVID, right? When we go to get a, a COVID test, what we're really doing is we're being screened for COVID. That means you're going to look for it because unless you uh, make that effort, you're not going to know it. The same is true for the liver because the liver doesn't tell us something's wrong. We have to go and make sure. It's like it's like checking in with uh, uh, a relative of ours to make sure they're okay, right? In this case, we're checking in with our liver to make sure that everything is okay. So keep that in mind when you make your own 
um, uh, hopefully annual physicals or more often, depending upon your situation. But uh, always be aware that you want to have that that liver um, uh, screening. Uh, it's done in two ways. One is through uh, blood testing. Uh, you've probably heard of the liver enzymes. Uh, on your report, it will be AST, ALT, GGT. Uh, you'll also have bilirubin there. Um, and so those are the things uh, that you're going to want to look at. But if you're in what we call a risk group uh, for liver disease, probably those blood tests are not enough. You want to go get what we call an imaging test. Uh, you know, just like we go for colonoscopies, right, as we reach a <coughs> certain age, um, it's also true that at a certain age, <coughs> we should have uh, a liver screen, we should have a, an imaging test of the liver. Just go take a quick picture of it, uh, make sure that everything is okay. Okay, so, so a, a, as you see there, uh, the liver is fascinating. Now, like, some, uh, like all the other parts of our bodies, um, what can interfere in the, the healthy functioning of our liver is disease. Um, and as you can see here now in the screen, there's more than 100 different things uh, that can affect our liver. Um, and, and as you see there, you know, many Americans are affected uh, by liver disease and many people don't know it. Um, and so that's, again, uh, back to my point about being screened. Um, the main topics or the main areas uh, of, of things that can cause liver disease um, I, you'll see on the screen there, right? Viral hepatitis. So viral hepatitis is referring to hepatitis A, B, C, and now D uh, is being added to that mix. Okay, those are viruses, and we're gonna talk about them in a little while, um, that if they're not addressed, um, uh, if, we, if we test positive for those things, they're not addressed, they can damage our liver. Um, the next one is probably, you know, the single most well-known way that our liver get damaged, gets damaged, and that's alcohol. Unfortunately, people think that's the only way, um, and that's not true. Um, but however, alcohol, as we know, uh, because that, that alcohol really is very caustic to our liver, and when we take in too much of it, uh, it creates damage. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or fatty liver disease, just as that name implies, um, that just as fat accumulates in other parts of our bodies, um, if fat begins to accumulate in and around our liver, um, that creates uh, damage. That's going to impede the functions of the liver, and that's going to bring about liver disease. And so, therefore, we have to be conscious of that. Cirrhosis, cirrhosis is that uh, uh, that disease that uh, the liver is extremely damaged. Uh, it's the liver is just not working anymore. We can go into what's called liver failure. Um, and that's kind of the, the later stages uh, of liver damage. And then as you can see there, cancer. Um, cancer can uh, uh, form in the liver itself. Um, we call that primary uh, liver cancer. That means perhaps because of a, a viral hepatitis, mostly B, um, or because of cirrhosis, um, that uh, liver, uh, that cancer tumors uh, can happen. And so we want to, to be careful of that. So this is a quick overview. We're going to go more into detail about these in a few minutes. But, but these are the things um, that occur that um, can cause damage. Now, the other thing uh, about uh, how liver disease develops and progresses um, is that no matter what um, cause of your liver disease is, so whether it is viral hepatitis, whether it is alcohol, whether it's poor diet, um, whether it's uh, medication use, uh, no matter what it is that gets the disease ball rolling, um, it's always going to follow, no matter how it started, it's always going to follow this same path. And so as you see here, we have that little image on the left there that shows, you know, the various stages. So, of course, stage zero, okay, that's a nice healthy liver you see there. It's, if you were to, to look at it, it's pinkish. Um, it looks like kind of a half football, right, flattened. Um, you can see that it, it's, it's kind of broken. It's not broken into two halves, but there is definitely a separation. We refer to each of those as lobes. Um, but as you can see, it's nice and pink. If you were to feel it, it's nice and squishy, again, like a sponge. Uh, that's a really healthy liver. But 
as the, the uh, disease begins to more and more take over, um, and that means that, remember, that healing, that regenerating quality of our liver is now beginning to fail because the, the disease um, is getting stronger than the liver's ability to, uh, to heal itself, and then that's how this progression is going to happen. Um, and then, uh, so fatty liver um, uh, is going to happen. Again, that's fat that's accumulated in and around uh, the liver, um, and those uh, fat cells uh, begin to interact with the uh, healthy liver cells and begins to like overpower them, okay? And so that's what's going to start to create uh, some damage. It's at this point that hopefully, if you have a blood test, that the liver enzymes are, are going to show uh, that something's wrong. And the way it does that is they elevate. So just by the, the liver's healthy uh, working, um, there, it, it produces enzymes. I like to think of this as a car engine, right? Even the most highly tuned car, when the engine's running, is going to have exhaust. And so there's an acceptable amount of exhaust, right? That's always going to be there. But if you see a car that's blowing a whole bunch of black smoke out of the tailpipe, you're going to say to yourself, wow, something must be happening with the engine, right? The, the smoke doesn't tell you what's happening. It just says that something might be happening. So with the liver, there's always an acceptable amount of liver enzymes that are produced. However, when the doctor tells you that your enzymes are elevated, that means your, your liver is, is blowing out or it's producing too much enzyme, that means your liver is working harder than it should and you're gonna have to look into that, okay? Uh, and then that's gonna progress along. What's gonna happen there next is gonna be if this, if this uh, pace continues, um, the liver is, be going, is gonna start to get uh, inflamed. Um, and inflamed means that it's going to begin to swell. Uh, the, the cells now are being affected. The liver is going to inflate itself. Um, it's going to begin. We're going to see that some of those cells on the surface begin to die. The other thing that happens at this stage is also uh, what we call fibrosis. Now, you might have heard that in various other parts of the body. Fibrosis means hardening. And so now what's happening is not only is the disease harming the, the functioning, the filtering function of the liver and, and so many of the other uh, things that the liver does, but now that nice squishy sponge, it's beginning to get dense. Um, and we call that fibrosis. And of course, that is going to affect the, uh, the filtering function and the general functioning of the liver itself. Okay, uh, you might've heard of a fibro scan. That's what, um, people will receive to see just how dense um, is the damage causing to our liver, okay? And then eventually that's going to move into the severe stage, uh, which is cirrhosis. Now, fibrosis and cirrhosis are talked about in four stages, okay? And that's simply just to let us know, you know, how, how damaged uh, the organ is. The fact that it's damaged at all is, is problematic and should be concerning. Um, but the idea is, uh, you know, we want to know, okay, well, how far now has this progressed? Now, people will say, well, what about that healing and, and regenerating, right? Um, and so um, one of the things that the healing and regenerating can do um, is that it, it makes liver disease progress slowly, right? Because it's always fighting to stay healthy. And so whenever something is, is trying to harm the liver, the liver is going to try to, you know, to keep healing itself. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, if the disease is too strong or overpowering, um, then the, the uh, regenerating and healing can't keep up with it. And that's why progression uh, is going to happen. But if somebody, let's say, finds out, you know, that they have, that they have fatty liver, certainly if they have cirrhosis, um, they've had that for years, okay? And they didn't know it because they did not get screened, right? And so that's why anybody who feels that they're in any of the, the risk groups uh, for disease really should get screened because like anything else, right? The sooner we catch something, the sooner we can do something about it. But this is the progression, uh, as I said, that no, really no matter what the underlying cause of the disease is, 
it's always going to follow the same path. Now, what you don't uh, see on here is cancer. Um, and the reason we, when sometimes when we show a slide like this, we put cancer like in parentheses. Uh, cirrhosis does not always lead to cancer. It can, right? And usually it's uh, the, why that happens is uh, specifically hepatitis B. So if somebody has chronic hepatitis B, they have to be very careful because uh, hepatitis B, when it causes liver disease, um, is known to then lead into cancer, okay? But just keep in mind that because somebody has cirrhosis, it's not always going to lead to cancer, but it can, okay? Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned some of these things here. So uh, how do we know, right? So I, I mentioned um, the fact that we checked, you'll see them at the top, the liver enzymes, right? We get those measured. Um, and so somebody who is overall healthy, right? There's no no risk group from from anything. They they you know eat right, they exercise. Um, if your uh, liver enzyme levels are all in the normal range, your doctor will will tell you you're good to go. There's there's really nothing kind of happening here. However, if you are somebody who is a either in one of those high risk groups. You've been taking medication for a long time. Uh, perhaps you do have a history of, of uh, alcohol use. Um, perhaps you're, you're overweight, obese, or you just know that your diet has not been good. We're going to then say uh, we, the next step we should do is to get into the imaging tests, right? Simple uh, scan, ultrasound, CT scan. Because of the fact, as I showed you there, um, liver uh, disease is visible. Most liver diseases are visible. We'll talk about some of the autoimmunes in a second. But for the most part, liver disease is, is visible. And that's why liver enzyme tests paired with an imaging test, CT ultrasound, is going to give you a really good idea of the health of your liver, right? And so, and these tests nowadays, the technology has advanced so much that instead of just look, seeing like a, a foggy blob uh, on a screen, uh, nowadays these, um, uh, these tests are really much more precise. Uh, so ultrasound CT. Uh, as you see, FibroScan is there. So a FibroScan, as I mentioned, uh, it's going to want to, if the doctor wants to know how much hardening is there, or uh, you'll see the word there, elastic, right? That's, that means kind of squishy, right? So if the doctor wants to know how, how far has the fibrosis uh, advanced, um, the doctor will order a fibro scan, okay? Um, and then the other one, MRI. Now, MRI is so detailed uh, and so expensive um, that very often uh, an MRI is not used unless it's determined that somebody does have a liver disease uh, and the fact that it is uh, advancing. And so, uh, or if, uh, if cancer is suspected, then the MRI, because the MRI kind of gives you that 3D kind of view um, of our bodies, or in this case of the liver, and so that's going to be helpful. But the, the previous uh, scans I mentioned usually are, are very good, uh, and then MRI might be a, a later resort. Same is true for a liver biopsy. Um, a biopsy is invasive. That means they got to go into your body and go into your liver. Doctors never want to do that, no matter what uh, health issue we have, right? A surgery or a procedure, anything invasive is always put off as, as much as they can. But if a doctor does say, we really need to, to see where this is at. We need to see that inflammation, right? We want to see how far the fat um, is, is uh, moving here. Then the doctor will order a liver biopsy. And, and uh, the biopsy, as we know, is a, a needle that's, um, uh, that goes uh, into a very precise area of your liver. You know, they're not just going to go anywhere. They're going to use the imaging test. They're going to use those scans. They're going to look and say, where in the, the liver here should we go? And those scans act as kind of a roadmap. And then that's the way the doctors know to get a precise place that they want to get in order to take the sample. And then that sample is uh, evaluated, it's tested, and that will give a much clearer picture of where somebody's liver disease is or how far um, it has advanced. Um, okay, so uh, so these are, um, uh, we mentioned uh, before some of these, but now we want you to see 
uh, where liver disease uh, in uh, places that are not as easy to determine. Okay, so viruses, you know, we can check for that, right? <clears throat> we can do a blood test, we can check for that. I mentioned the alcohol, you know, diet, obesity. Um, those, those are uh, things that we, we know. But there's going to be a few in here uh, that um, are, are going to be ways that may not be as clear to us. And the first one that we see there is going to be genetics, right? That means that when you go to the doctor, right, we always have to tell the doctor about our family history, right? How is your parents' health? How are your grandparents' health, right? If, if they're deceased now, what led to that? You know, what, what did they pass from? Because as we know, uh, along with our good looks and along with our gifts and talents that get passed uh, to us uh, through our family tree, unfortunately, uh, there are some things such as uh, uh, predisposition to certain diseases or illnesses that can also be passed along. Doesn't mean we're definitely going to um, suffer from it, but it's definitely something that we need to watch. And so, you know, the doctor is, is going to ask any any family history of liver disease because that could play a role uh, in your current uh, situation. Autoimmune disease uh, is another one. So, an autoimmune disease means that our uh, autoimmune system, right? And as we know, our autoimmune system is sort of our safety shield, right? When something foreign comes into our body that wants to harm us, our autoimmune system immediately uh, steps up, goes after it and attacks it and destroys it. So when, um, so when a, a, a virus comes in, or again, if we breathe something, right? If we breathe that secondary smoke, um, if, our, if our body identifies it as being foreign and being problematic, our autoimmune system automatically sends out antibodies. We're hearing a lot about antibodies because of COVID, but our body will then send out the antibodies that attack it and kill it. An autoimmune disease means that those antibodies get a little confused. And, it would, and what happens is our antibodies can identify parts of our own bodies as being foreign and they can begin to attack it. Now, how this happens and why it happens is really unknown. Uh, however, for the purposes of liver disease, um, usually what'll happen is uh, our autoimmune system can attack our bile ducts. The bile ducts are those little tubes uh, that remember I said that pass the, the bile that's produced into the gallbladder and then into a digestive system. In some people, for some reason, uh, the, our, their autoimmune system identifies those bile ducts as being something foreign, and they begin to attack them um, and literally destroy them. Um, and that's going to lead, obviously, to liver disease. Um, so that, that's what we mean by um, autoimmune disease. It's when our own immune system uh, uh, mistakenly identifies uh, something about our own selves as being foreign. Um, you know, if somebody gets a, a transplant, let's say a liver transplant, right? Uh, that person will always have to take, sometimes we call them anti-rejection medications. But what they really are, um, they're, they're uh, medications uh, that will lower the immune system so it doesn't identify this, what really is a foreign body, right? A new liver, you know, um, but we, we, what we try to prevent is from the immune system to saying, wow, this is something, you know, not from us, we need to attack it. Um, and so that's why somebody is given uh, autoimmune suppressants, right? Um, and now the, the good side of that is it, it helps prevent our body from attacking the new organ. The challenge is that it's lowering our immune system. And so we need to be careful um, about uh, get, you know, contracting other diseases or viruses, things like that. We're hearing that about COVID, right? Um, if somebody is immunosuppressant, right, then they want that person to get the COVID vaccine because they want to uh, protect um, uh, uh, against the person being too susceptible to getting a COVID or anything else uh, for that matter, okay? So these are the, the things there. And I, I, we, met, we talked about the medications before and certainly street drugs or things like that uh, fall into that same category. Um, you know, a couple of terms, you know, if you do go to your doctor um, or have some testing, a few terms that you are going to hear about. Um, uh, one is hepatitis. Now, literally, 
hepatitis means uh, anything HEPA, anything you see, H-E-P-A, is going to be liver related. Titus means inflammation. So hepatitis means that there's an inflammation of the liver. Now, we don't want to confuse this with viral hepatitis because they really are two separate things. It's almost unfortunate uh, that we, we call it viral hepatitis, like A, B, C, or now D. Um, but we just want to keep the distinction in mind. The, on its own, hepatitis means uh, liver disease or inflammation of our liver. Viral hepatitis are caused by viruses. Um, and, an acute infection um, means that it's something that makes us sick quickly, right? That's the word acute. Now, when it comes to liver disease, um, there are very few um, things that cause an acute infection in our liver, right? Because remember before, liver is always fighting to stay healthy. Um, and so uh, there are very few things that are going to cause an instant or quick damage to our liver. Um, however, there are things. So for instance, if somebody were to have an overdo overdose of medication, right? Uh, that, that great amount of medication that's taking overwhelms the liver uh, because again, it's going to get processed through there, right? And that can cause what we uh, refer to as liver failure. That means it's like a shock uh, to the liver, uh, all, that, all the, that medication or all those pills, whatever it was. So, so that can cause acute infection. That means that could bring on a very quick uh, damage uh, or infection to our liver. Um, the other way this can happen is, let's say if you're in a car accident, um, and let's say you know in that accident uh, you you ha get a blow to uh, your your right under your your right rib cage there right that's where the liver is located and um, sometimes the the liver that shock to the liver can cause a liver failure um, and so that that's a case of where something acute uh, can happen quickly um, the thing with acute uh, liver failure is that it can be uh, cured it can be healed. Once the um, either that um, whatever the substance was that was taken uh, for the uh, overdose, you know that's removed from the system, and then some other medicines are are given to the person uh, to kind of you know uh, relieve themselves, and then over time uh, the liver will begin to get back to to health, back to normal. Chronic infection is uh, the, the complete opposite. So chronic infection means that somebody has had uh, a disease for a very long time. Um, and so it means that no longer can the immune system fight uh, the disease. It means our liver is not able to itself uh, fight the disease. And then we begin on that path that I showed you before uh, that shows you how the disease progresses, right? So chronic infection over a long period of time, acute infection, something that happens quickly, okay? Acute infection, not very common. Chronic infection is common when it comes to liver disease. Um, I, I spoke about the others, the antibody, you know, that's what your body produces to fight disease. Antigen um, is, you know, and again, we're hearing about these things with COVID, right? And antigen is something that means that, um, you know, that you have a live virus um, in your system and that it needs to be taken care of. A vaccine, uh, as we know, um, imitates our immune system and seeks for a certain type of virus, goes after it um, and cures it. Um, okay, so now I wanna get a little more specific into a few things that can bring about uh, liver disease. And, and we can move through this quickly because I, I did speak about it uh, you know, generally before. And again, this is just an overview of, of our liver. So these are the viral hepatitis is ABC. <clears throat> D reflects uh, very much the same type of thing as B. Um, so the important aspects of viral hepatitis um, are that uh, hepatitis A, so how do we get it? Usually it's because of contaminated food or drink. Um, you know, this happens, you know, very often we hear this in association to a restaurant, right? We'll hear a, a certain restaurant had an outbreak of hepatitis A. That means that because of either poor uh, refrigeration or sterilization, um, uh, there, this virus got into the food and then when somebody ingests it, it gives them hepatitis A. Very often if you visit a, a country that may not have uh, terrific 
um, sterilization uh, or, or hygienics, uh, this can happen. Uh, sometimes we refer to this as food poisoning, right? Uh, the thing about it, uh, it's acute. That means it happens quickly. The good thing about it is that it usually, our body takes care of it um, and it go it's gone quickly as well. Um, you cannot be uh, infected more than once because what happens is when your body uh, uh, is exposed to this, um, if we, uh, the uh, antibodies uh, from our or immune system go after this, um, and then it's always aware of it. So uh, we, we uh, build up those antibodies. That's why we can only be infected once. Um, uh, there is a vaccination for this. And of course, we never want to be infected with anything, even though hepatitis A is something that our body can usually handle. Uh, we do want to get the vaccination. Now, hepatitis B is going to be something a little bit uh, more complicated. Um, usually, this um, uh, is transferred from one person to another uh, through bodily fluids. So if people are intimate with each other, um, if people are sharing, um, let's say, silverware, or uh, you know, if they live together and they're, they're sharing certain things, um, it could be passed on from one person to another. Uh, blood, uh, saliva, things like that. That's how hepatitis B can be a move from one person to another. Uh, now, the thing with hepatitis B is that for the most part, the population, their own immune system can, uh, can deal with it, can take care of it. Um, there is a certain segment, though, of the population. Um, some will say anywhere from 5 to 15 percent of people who contract hepatitis B, their own immune system is not going to be able uh, to handle it. Unfortunately, there's no cure for hepatitis B. So if a person uh, is diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B, there are medications that they can take and they should take them that will prevent this virus from causing any other health-related issues. Um, because, and this is important, hepatitis B, if untreated or unaddressed, can lead to cirrhosis and to liver cancer. So people need to be screened for this and to know what their status is. Um, if somebody um, contracted uh, hepatitis B, their body cleared it, don't need to worry about it anymore. It's not going to happen again. And yes, there is a vaccination. We say we don't want to get sick to begin with, so get the vaccination. Hepatitis C, uh, which was only discovered in like the 90s, hepatitis C happens uh, through direct blood-to-blood -blood contact. Now, this happened, um, uh, uh, again, in like the 90s uh, because the blood supply was not checked for hepatitis C. Um, and so what happens is if somebody, uh, let's say if they gave birth and needed blood or they had an accident, they needed blood or anything like that, um, they might have been exposed to hep C because they, the, the blood supply wasn't checked for that. Uh, the problem with hepatitis C is, is quite the opposite from hepatitis B, and that is the majority of people's bodies, immune systems, cannot cure it on its own. And so those people are going to need medication. Thankfully, um, the past few years, new medications have been developed uh, that can cure hepatitis C. You've probably seen them on the television, uh, Maverick, Eplusa, Harvoni, um, and in, in a matter of 8 to 12 weeks, this can be cured. Um, the hepatitis C is different that you can be reinfected, so people need to be careful. Unfortunately, at this time, there's no vaccine, but it's being worked on for sure. And so, um, so we, we want to make sure that, um, again, we want to make sure that we get screening for these things and for the ones that have, um, for the ones that have um, uh, vaccines, we want to get those. Now, you might have seen me f uh, go quickly through my screen there because I basically talked about uh, all the things uh, in regard to the viral hepatitis. So the next thing we touched upon before, and I'm watching the time, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, you can see here what this is about. I mentioned it quickly before. Just as the name implied, it means that some fat cells are developing in and around the liver, um, and that could begin to impair the, uh, the liver's um, functioning. The good news about um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it can be reversed. So if you go to the doctor, the doctor does a uh, an imaging test and says you have NAFLD. <laughs> That's what it's referred to, NAFLD. Um, and uh, this means that 
you can um, address this, and it's all done with diet. There are very few medications that can treat liver disease. Um, and But however, having said that, nutrition actually is a treatment. And sometimes when the doctor says, eat right, you know, watch your weight, um, and we roll our eyes. But when it comes to the liver, that is the treatment. And so if somebody gets on a very healthy diet, the Mediterranean diet is the proven effective diet for liver disease, um, you can literally get rid of the fat uh, that's in your liver. And that's important because if you don't, unfortunately, that's going to join that path, that progression of the disease that's going to cause uh, more trouble. Okay. So um, also know that fatty liver affects people even if they're not overweight. Uh, I always say skinny people can get fatty liver too. So, so just because somebody might, their BMI might be uh, in an acceptable range, you still want to be careful. Also, people who don't drink alcohol can get this. That's why it's, it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If somebody does get uh, liver disease because of alcohol, it would just be referred to as fatty liver disease. Okay. Um, and so here are some things, you know, we, we mentioned weight, of course, um, but we, people who are diabetics, people who have certain heart diseases or high blood pressure, um, cholesterol, all those people want to be careful and be screened for, for fatty liver because uh, the, remember, liver is part of a, a system, right? And so a problem in some of these other systems can also uh, be a problem uh, for the liver. Um, and as I mentioned, the treatment, uh, we call these lifestyle changes, okay, uh, that somebody um, wants to be, be careful. Uh, and again, uh, because nutrition can act as the treatment, it can reverse that. Um, so, uh, so the other thing, again, as we know, alcohol, right, <laughs> the number one uh, thing in everybody's mind about uh, it causing liver disease. And um, I'll just say that... Um, what, what is really the problem with alcohol um, is, as the screen says there, excessive drinking. Because our liver can only process a couple of ounces of liver at a time, uh, of liver, <laughs> of alcohol at a time. So that means that um, if, if somebody is out and it's happy hour, Right, as you see in this screen here now. So what's what's acceptable, right? Somebody uh, 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 somebody could drink 12 ounce beer, right? And you have a 12 ounce beer, fine. The liver can handle that. The liver can process it, no problem. But if you're at happy hour and those beers are half price, uh, you're gonna wanna drink as many of those half price uh, beers as you can. That's the problem because now we're overwhelming our liver and so not only is the liver not processing all the alcohol, but the, the, but the alcohol is beginning to harm the cells. And that's what's kind of beginning to create that liver disease, okay? And so that's why we wanna be careful that um, it's not so much that people drink alcohol, it's how much and in what time frame. So uh, I mentioned the Mediterranean diet before. You know, the Mediterranean diet allows for some wine or for some beer. Right, but you can see, as is shown in this graphic here, it's only a little bit, right? And so that's what we want to be careful of. That's why with with younger people, well, who binge drink, well, <laughs> and older people too. But right, we we go to a lot of colleges and high schools and talk about uh, alcohol use because we don't want them binging, um, because again, that's what's uh, really create. And if that's done over a long period of time even if it only happens on the weekends, right? If somebody binges on Friday night or Saturday uh, and don't have anything until the next week and do the same thing, over time, that's gonna uh, create a problem. The liver is not gonna be able to keep up with it and um, it's gonna create the harm and the disease will happen. Uh, Drug-induced, as I mentioned, prescription medications, now all of them will say, your doctor will check, with liver uh, check for liver disease. We wanna be careful of over-the-counter. And the reason why we highlight this is because over-the-counter is what we ourselves think we need, right? We see all those vitamins and all those supplements um, and we have no real guide um, just because the label says this is what it's gonna do for you or the advertising says this is what it's gonna do for you. Um, it doesn't mean that we should take it. Supplements are just as that word indicates. They are supplements to what your body may not be uh, getting. For instance, I went to the doctor 
uh, I had a, I went to actually a dietitian. The doctor, the dietitian, did a blood test and said, "Oh, you seem to be deficient in vitamin D." So I recommend a supplement. So that's why you take a supplement because your body, for some reason, is not absorbing it from food, real food, which is where we should get all of our vitamins and minerals, not from pills. Um, but there's a case of where our body might be deficient. That's when a supplement um, is useful. And so uh, we want to be careful. We're, we're, we're a country that so overdoes it with, with vitamins and, and minerals and all this stuff we're buying over the counter. Um, and at best, uh, we're, we're just wasting our money. Um, at worst, it's creating issues for us. And so be very careful about anything over the counter that you're using um, because um, it may not be doing for you what you think it is. Definitely stay away. We tell people all the time, stay away from anything that claims to be a liver boost, uh, liver cleanse. We don't need it. We don't need any of those things. A nice, good, fresh meal um, is going to be what, what our liver needs, not some pill that says it does it. Acetaminophen is found in, in um, many, many um, aspirins. And so we want to be careful with that. When we're talking about uh, this, uh, especially with aspirin, you know, this is for people who may have suffered from chronic pain or somebody, let's say, who exercises a lot, right? They're always at the gym, they're always exercising, and they're always having aches and pains, and they'll pop a, a couple of aspirin to get rid of it. That's going to cause uh, liver problems for us, and so we want to be very careful of the use. Only use um, you hear this all the time, only use as directed and for the short period that you need it. It's the long-term use and the overuse of things, even as, as simple as aspirin that's creating liver disease. Okay. And finally, here are some other <clears throat> um, diseases that are what we would call rare, but they, they do happen. So um, autoimmune hepatitis, I talked about this before, anything with the autoimmune system means our own body, unfortunately, is seeing uh, the liver as being foreign and begins to attack it. And so we, we need to be careful of that. Biliary atresia, um, that is mostly in infants. Um, and it's when the bile ducts um, are not able to move the bile along in the way that it should, and the buildup of bile can create liver disease. So that's an important one. Uh, hemochromatosis, primary biliary cholangitis, uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, all those have to do with our own body attacking our um, liver, and we need to pay attention to that. So finally, um, so what are some of the signs? Remember what I said before, okay, our liver for the most part, is not going to tell us something is wrong. When we begin to show signs and symptoms, unfortunately, it means the, the, the disease maybe has progressed along. But if we see any of these signs, address them right away. Okay, jaundice, that's the coloring of our, the yellowing, right? We see people with jaundice and, and that's usually indication of liver or in some cases, kidneys, okay? Somebody, abdominal swelling, that means fluid is building up. We call that ascites. We want to be careful with that. Um, anything to do with our digestive system, right? So for our urine, our stool is, uh, is a weird color, uh, uh, has a, a more stronger odor. Uh, we need to pay attention to that because that means that, you know, some now, and that's, that's over time, okay? Um, not, not on one or two occasions, but that means over time, if you see that happening, you got to you pay attention to it, okay? Uh, liver disease causes fatigue. That means that people are tired all the time. It's because the liver is not pulling the um, nutrients uh, from the food we're eating, and so we, we need to be careful of that. Some other things, too, like, you know, itching. The, for, doctors don't know why this is, but some liver diseases uh, will uh, create some itching. Again, you want before any of those things happen, you want to be screened. You you want to make sure that your liver is okay. It's a simple it's simple testing, um, but it will save a lot of heartache uh, later on if you do pay attention to that. And and so here um, you can see uh, the liver foundation uh, information. Our national helpline uh, is here, which we mentioned before is my area uh, that I oversee uh, in the liver foundation. Uh, you can we do live chat. Um, on if you go to the website, you can live chat with us. You can email us at info at a liver foundation. 
or you can call that number. Um, and then on the right side, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing. The internet is a terrible thing. Um, and so we want to make sure that when we're going to look uh, for information, we go to the right places, okay? Usually uh, places like the CDC, National Institutes of Health, uh, Choose My Plate or EatRight.org, those are nutrition sites. Know Your Dose, that's going to tell you about, remember before we talked about aspirin and some of those kinds of things. Make sure you go to reliable sources. Usually a general rule of thumb, if a website is a .gov, .gov, if it's a .org, O-R-G, or if it's a .edu, you're probably going to get good, uh, reputable uh, information from those sites, okay? Because those are the places that um, are reliable. They're giving the, the good information, and that's, as a rule of thumb, where you want to go. And then, of course, I'll finish with this. Always go to Needy Meds. Needy Meds, our friends, um, needymeds.org uh, to have, uh, if you have any uh, uh, areas that you need some, some help with your medications or treatments or travel or any of those medically related things, go to our friends at Needy Meds because their website is the best. Second, of course, to the American Liver Foundation. So that's my presentation today. I hope uh, that you learned a little something. I hope you have a greater appreciation for the liver. Um, as you can see, I do because of all the fascinating uh, aspects of it um, and also be cautious of it is so fascinating, we don't want to harm it. And so uh, hopefully um, those are some of the takeaways from our time together today. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over now to uh, Carla if you want to uh, pick it up. Fantastic. Warren, thank you so much for the very thorough and, as always, enthusiastic presentation. Um, one of my favorite things about the American Liver Foundation, I think this is really important, is not only, and I take for granted that the information ALF has is accurate, current, and up-to-date, but what I have said in many previous presentations is both the people that work there and the information that, they sh that is shared on the website makes it so easy for people like myself, a lot of people that are not experts when it comes to the liver, it makes it easy for us to not only understand how important the liver is, but provide real life, actual, actionable steps we can take to ensure that our liver is and remains healthy. So, and as I can see from the feedback we're getting from our audience, which everybody seems to be agreeing with that sentiment. So thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for being here. As Warren, Warren said, we do want to be conscious of the time. So we are going to sneak in just a few questions that have come in from the audience. Before we get to those, I'll jump on what Warren just said at the end as he wrapped up his presentation, that if you are having difficulty affording your medications, other healthcare costs, or need other information about uh, various diagnoses, please don't don't hesitate to turn to Needy Meds. Check out our website, needymeds.org, and don't hesitate to reach out to our call center counselors. And I'll put that phone number along with the other contact information for the ALF up on the screen in just a moment. There it is. And I'll keep that up as we get to the questions coming in. And like I said, if you did ask a question we didn't have a chance to get to, I will follow up with you. Um, myself, Warren, um, or one of our team members will follow up with you, or you can reach out to the contact information on that screen. Um, but let's get to at least a couple of these questions came in. And one of them, Warren, and I, I want to really sneak this one in before we wrap it up, because I bet in the past year or so, less than a year, you're probably getting this a lot, which is as a person currently with liver disease, should I have any concerns at all about getting the COVID vaccine? Ah, uh, oh, okay, great. Uh, yes, I'm so happy that this came up because uh, uh, unfortunately we're still dealing with COVID, right? We we were hoping that we would be on it, but now now we unfortunately because of Delta and all this kind of stuff, we're not. Um, yes, so 
uh, AASLD, the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. Okay, that's the, the national and international organization that does all the research and, and does all of the uh, important work in regard to uh, liver disease. Uh, members of that organization have been working with the CDC and the NIH uh, a specific to issues of liver disease and COVID. And the bottom line is that in regard to the vaccines, um, everyone should get the vaccine, okay? The, the vaccine has been formulated so that it will not have any negative interactions with the liver. The only thing that somebody might see happen is that their liver enzymes uh, after receiving the vaccine uh, might uh, jump up a little bit. Uh, that's only because um, anytime we, um, uh, in, in bring something new into our body, again, right, it gets filtered through the liver as the vaccine does. Uh, however, um, given the strength of the, va of the vaccines, uh, there's gonna be a little bit of a jump in the enzyme levels, but that will last a few days and go away. Most of us don't even know that because we're not, uh, you know, you, you'd have to be getting a blood test in a, in a short time after receiving the vaccine. So, uh, so anybody li with liver disease or without, um, everyone should get the vaccines against COVID. Thank you so much for that clear and um, really trusted answer because um, that's the other thing about ALS. They, when you get an answer from them, they will have the data and the updated research to back it up. So thank you for the question. And as you said, Warren, um, I'm sure that that comes up a lot. So it was a great opportunity yes. to address something. Yep. And, you know, yep. this actually goes, goes you, you talked about how after the vaccine, your liver enzyme numbers may spike for a few days, which is normal because something new is being processed through the, the liver to be right. expected and that the numbers will revert back to normal um, if they were only elevated due to the vaccine within a few days. Yes. That actually dovetails great into the next question, which is, I had um, a liver blood test and it actually showed high numbers for the first time. Is that something I should be worried about? Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, a number of things can affect um, the enzyme levels uh, in our system. Not all bad, most mostly not uh, negative. Um, you know, uh, in all of our blood testing, right, all of the, the levels, no matter what's being uh, looked at, whether it's enzyme levels, liver, whether it's um, cholesterol, whether it's uh, blood counts, there's always a range, right? Because these numbers do fluctuate, uh, you know, uh, for various reasons. Uh, when it comes to the liver, um, a great a great example of this was uh, a woman um, had contacted us for this reason. She went to the physician, she got her testing back, and her numbers were elevated. So we talked a little bit. Um, for the, and she said for the first time. So she, uh, we talked a little bit and I found out that she had just come back from a 10 day cruise. Um, and uh, along with being very jealous of her uh, because of that, um, I said to her, you know, when you go away, do you, do you eat and drink? Maybe a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, not part of your regular routine. And of course she, she said that that would be the case. And um, we said, uh, you know what? That probably has done it. And so what, what happens for anybody, when you get uh, uh, the, the enzyme tests that show elevated, right? The, what, what happens is the doctor will tell you, come back in, oh, about three to four months. And during this time, watch your diet, you know, watch your, your lifestyle, make sure that all things are being equal and then come back and we'll test it again. Because when we get a test, right, it's a snapshot. Right, so it's one day at one time period, um, and what's important with any of these levels, the, certainly liver enzymes, but any of our blood levels, is what is it over time? Because these numbers do fluctuate, and a lot of things go up and down. And so, if if you're somebody who went and your your numbers were elevated, um, again, the doctor probably will tell you just what I said. You'll go back, and and chances are they're gonna be back in the normal range. Now, if they're not, that's when the doctor will say, you know what, let's do a imaging test. So let's do one of those CTs or let's do one of those ultrasounds and let's take a look 
because again, that would be the, the next uh, phase of that. So uh, a lot of things affect the levels, but it's, it's the, the longitudinal, it's the over the long term that we want to see a spike here or there, um, natural part of, of our biology and physiology, but we want to watch it over time. Thank you so much for the thorough answer. And it does, um, it really gives us, certainly me, hope, as you said. I mean, certainly <laughs> jealous of jealous of people um, going away and, you know, partying a little bit, you know, drinking a little more than usual, um, eating a little too many desserts. But it's very hopeful for me because I've been known to do that just on a weekend home, especially through COVID. So it's mm -hmm. good to know that we can be, we can all be really proactive about making sure that our liver remains super healthy. Right. So thank you, right. thank you. And thank you to our audience for those great questions. As you know, and I said in the beginning and repeat now, we do try to keep the question segment brief. So if you did ask a question we didn't get a chance to answer, we will follow up with you by email, but don't hesitate to reach out to the American Liver Foundation or Needy Meds at the contact information on your screen right now. Also, you can go ahead and download my PowerPoint slide deck, but more importantly, Warren's PowerPoint slide deck, as well as three other attachments he wanted to share with our attendees from the American Liver Foundation. I also encourage you to check out their website. It's chock full of really useful information that is applicable to anyone, um, patients, caregivers, um, healthcare professionals, um, everyone. So don't um, don't forget to check them out. And it's always a good idea to follow them and Needy Meds on social media as well. So with that, thank you to my friend and colleague Warren um, for sharing his expertise and passion for the subject with the Needy Meds audience. I have already roped him into returning next year um, for some presentations on the Needy Meds 2022 calendar. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. And to our audience, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to join us. We hope to see your name pop up in future presentations. Thanks, everyone, and take good care. Bye. Bye, Carla. Bye.